This is a little interview, really, to get a little more information about your life with Tim and how everything started. Would you like to take us back in time to where it really began? What, meeting Tim or the um, exciting things that happened afterwards? Well, I think you could talk about where you met him at the start. Well, we were introduced, mm. <laughs> which is a bit unusual in... Uh, in uh, the, these days, but our friends introduced us, and we would, we both had an unhappy time, so we rather gravitated towards each other, and um, eventually we did we were able to marry, and we had a wonderful life together. But you managed to inspire each other, didn't you? You were yes. fed off each other, and it was well, really a team effort. He said to me when soon after we'd met that he thought we could do anything together, which is a nice feeling. Yeah, lovely. You have confidence there. Yes. You've um, got a good sidekick. Yes. <laughs> so where was the first trip you made with um, what we call, Christian was called Tim, you called him Tim, and I, I called him Tim. Well, where did you first go? Where was the first journey overseas? Libya, 1960. Yes. But that was with his work, which was with BP. Uh, he was exploration manager out in Libya. But there we did come across the most wonderful Roman ru uh, ruins, uh, lovely cities built on the coast. And um, they, I think, inspired us because we saw them and then we, we took friends and guests out to see them too and we got to know them quite well. And um, I think that was the beginning of our my ancient interest, but Tim had already got onto that bandwagon in southern Persia when he first went out there as a young, as a young geologist. He went to Oxford, he loved mountains, he wanted to be a geologist because he loved mountains. Yes, and they put him on the plains <laughs> and, uh, of southern Persia. Southern Persia, so he wrote these wonderful letters home to his mother when he was travelling yes. uh, from England across France to Marseille, on a ship from Marseille to Egypt, Egypt to Beirut. And then the letter, lovely letter home to his mother um, when he's crossing the Lebanon mountains for the first time, mm. the Lebanon mountains and the anti-Lebanon mountains, on his road to Damascus, as it was, mm. because that's where he was heading for, on the what was, I think, the company bus. Uh, well, he was heading for uh, um, the southern, southern Persia. Um, he went through all those places on the way, but he was out in the um, more or less desert. Um, and um, that's where he had to start his job, which was surveying for oil. And it was doing that under the senior geologists that they both found the most wonderful ruins of the ziggurat of Chogazambil. Uh, they simply found a, an inscribed a cuneiform brick, and um, they whisked it off to the French archaeological group who were working there, and it turned out in the end to be excavated, and it was just a beautiful building. And uh, this was the Durintosh ziggurat. Yes. Complicated names to say. Yeah. Not far from Susa in That's the plains right. with views of the Zagros Mountains. Yes. And when they went up, I think in the morning as the sun was rising, yeah, on a they saw all the field systems, ancient field systems of the past on the plains mm. and the shadows all the way back to the mountains mm. and realized that there was a great agricultural civilization there once, which I think the dating is probably before 2000 BC or mm -hmm. thereabouts. Yes. And that inspired him, didn't it? Yes, certainly and did. That was 1936. Yes. But after that, he didn't spend much time on it because um, he was very busy with the company. Um, he flew around the world and he went to Australia and um, um, he went back to Persia and. Um, when I met him, he was actually in London office. But when he first met uh, your father, who was my Uncle Pat, and, he, and Uncle Pat said, What do you do, young man? He said, I'm looking out how far the Rocky Mountains have moved in the last yes. mil hundred million years. That's right. And he had. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was, and that tickled my father, I must say. Can <laughs> uh, come down to your work with him in the desert, in, the, in that Lebanon, you know, when you actually started working with him on location. 
uh, first time that you did a, a vocational. You mean company. for the work we we did, not the, the company, because I was in the company with him right. uh, abroad. Thinking more the archaeology. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's when we retired. He he came home and he used to tease me by saying, "When I retire and you start work." because it was a very easy life in Iran for us then. We had servants and it was just a joke that and it's true, I had to start work. Um, but then we um, had joined the British Unidentified Flying Objects Research Association, known as Bufora for short, because we had become interested in um, the sky and what went on up there. And we went to a lecture on ley lines and in the morning, he said, I don't really believe in that. Um, he got out the Ordnance Survey map to try and disprove that ley lines existed. And he found um, some points which were equidistant in our area, which intrigued him. So he started working on that. And he said, um, it looks as if somebody laid out something here. And um, he said, if I'm right, there should be a marker of some kind, a stone or a mound here. And we would get in the car and go off and see if we could find it, which was very exciting. And in the end, on this 26-mile stretch, we found about, I think it was 11, was it 11 markers? Not all was in the right position, but, but, but nearby. Then we thought he did um, some work and some research on one of the earthworks that they were joining. This, this line was joining, which was Wanderbury. And he decided that originally it had been built as an observatory, an astro astronomical observatory. And he dated it on his computer by going back through the years to 2500 or 2450 BC, take or give about 200 years. Um, so we asked ourselves at that point who could possibly have done this work.